started the first night looking at how we all need a new beginning, how we all had some difficult times. And we said, every time God gave a new beginning to his people, he set them on the rock that they were not shaken. And in order to become those persons, when the storms of life, the, the winds, the storms, the rains will come and hit, so that we don't get crumpled down, so that it doesn't knock us down, so that we can stand straight, stand tall. Even though bad things might happen to us, it will not destroy us. How do we become that person? We turn to Jesus. He said, if you do these things that I'm telling you, you will be like a strong house that's built on the rock. What did he say? If you keep my word. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, not only hearing, but doing. When you hear something today, if you hear something this weekend, it's useless if you don't do it. If it doesn't, it's not going to change any of our lives if we don't apply what we get from here. If something penetrates your heart, if something bothers you, if something is difficult to hear, I ask that you deal with it. Look into it. Why is it bothering me? Is this my pride? Am I trying to overlook something? Am I trying to act like this issue doesn't exist in my life? Am I trying to bury it? Oh, I know this. I've read this a million times. Great. But what does he say? Act on them. If you act on what you hear, you will be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. When the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Now, what were the words? We started looking. First, he started telling us to become this person this unshakable, strong person that's built this house that's built on the rock. Rock foundation, not the sand foundation. He started building this, this character sketch of a Christian, a believer. Today, if you're here and you're not a believer, this does not apply to you. You can enjoy yourself. But if you're a Christian, you hear something difficult, this applies to you. To all of us. First, Jesus started by saying, look, in order to even become a Christian, your activities needs to be one of humility, brokenness, poor in spirit. You desire to live righteously. You're gentle. You're a peacemaker. Even if it's going to cost you, even if it's going to mean that you're going to be persecuted, you're still willing to do the right thing. Now, these are the inner qualities of the believer. Then he spoke about our relationship to the world. A believer should be, as it relates to the world, as, as though it was salt. And it was, we said, so preserves, adds test, a taste. And um, and it, it adds flavor. We are to be like lights to the world. Shining light in the darkness. You know, if, if there are certain groups that you might find yourselves in, that you are the only source of light in that group. Live accordingly. Know the responsibility that comes from that. Now he's going to talk about this Christian person as it relates to personal relationships. 
in between us and others. There's going to be tonight some subjects that will be hard to hear. But let's see what the Lord says. He says, you have heard it said in the ancient, ancient times, you shall not commit murder. Whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, now, what Jesus is doing over here is saying, you've heard it this way. You've heard something. But I'm telling you the root cause, the heart of the matter. We all know here, if you want to solve the problem, you must solve the root cause of the problem. If you have cancer, you can use as many band-aids as you want. It's not going to heal you. It's the same when it comes to Christian life and what, what God wants from us. We must deal with the root causes of our problems, our issues. He said, if you're angry, I'm uh, sorry, if, if you've heard it, it was said that it was, uh, you shall not commit murder. Whoever commits murder shall be liable in the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you're good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go to fiery hell. Now, let's stop here. This is not some person teaching out of the blue. This is Jesus, who is Son of God, is telling us, if you get angry with your brother, you're going to go to hell. How serious is that? How serious is hell? This is Jesus. It's not some random person that you meet on the street. So, do we just take this and go over it? Cover it up? Justify our anger when we are angry with our brother or sister? Mostly sister. <laughs> what do we do? Is this heavy? Do we excuse it away? Who here never got angry in their life? Uh, other than Pat. Okay, tell me, according to what Jesus says, are we all going to hell? Yeah. yeah. Depends. Okay, show me the escape clause. <laughs> we all deserve <laughs> hell, Steve. Hey. You're forgiven, right. So, the, the issue is what? The issue is the root cause of murder is anger. So, that potential for murder, you say, I would never. But we all have that potential. Remember, we said last session that we are all guilty sinners, all in need of forgiveness. Now he's proving it to us. Well, I'm not as bad. Yes, you are. Yes, I am. We are all as bad. Unless you accept it, you're never going to be forgiven. So, if we all have the potential to murder, because we all have the potential to be angry, <laughs> not a potential, it's a fact. We all get angry. How serious should we take this walk that's Christianity? And if you tell your brother you're good for nothing, that's it. You've committed murder. Who hasn't done that? I've called worse things to people. 
We are all guilty of it. But this is God's standard. Is June angry? Is that why you're looking at it? June, are you an angry person? <laughs> <laughs> I think June makes me angry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What, the, uh, what does that mean, Joe? If you make him angry, what does that mean for him? <laughs> it's his problem, but he's gone to hell according to what we just said. It's, I don't want to make light of it. It's, it's serious. Especially if you call out, if, I mean, if you call ourselves Christians, we need to know the standard of Christianity. Therefore, and this is so important, being angry. If you present your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come present your offering. What is he talking about the altar and the offering? In the Old Testament, you know, they had to have offerings. They had to offer it to the Lord as a part of their worship. Not having an issue with your brother is so important that you should even put aside worshiping God. First go fix that problem with your brother. And then come worship God. Heavy. I don't know how it applies to every single one of you. You all have different issues. I have different issues. You all have different connections, different relationships. But it's up to you to find out and work out what this means in your life. This issue of anger, unforgiveness. We'll talk about that with another sermon or retreat maybe. And then he explains the urgency of it. He says, verse 25, this is chapter 5, verse 25. Make friends quickly with your opponent at the law while you're with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judges and the judge to the officer and you thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of it until you pay for every last cent. It's urgent. It's very important that we live at peace with everybody. It's very important that we have short accounts with people. It's very important not to hold on to grudges days and weeks and months and years. It's very important to not to act like everything is okay when everything is not. If you have an issue with somebody, you must deal with it. If you act like there is no problem, meanwhile there is a problem, you're a hypocrite and a liar. If there is a problem, deal with it. Go talk to the person. Go Amen. deal with it. Amen. Real quickly, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Chapter 4. Therefore, laying aside, this is verse 25, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, laying aside falsehoods, that means lying, speak truth to each other with your neighbor so that we are members of one another. Be angry, verse 26, do, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You see the same urgency. Be angry. Even if you get angry, you got to deal with it. Don't wait until the next day to deal with it. That's the biblical narrative. That's the biblical teaching. You have an issue, you got to deal with it right there and then. Don't wait until the next day. Why? Apostle Paul adds something else here. Do not give the devil an opportunity. And as long as you just simmer in your bitterness and unforgiveness or whatever false attitude you might be holding, 
Maybe you might be right, you might be wrong, but that attitude is wrong. If you don't deal with it, sit down and talk to them. Whatever it is, it must be resolved. Escaping conflict is not a Christian attribute. Pretending like there is no issues is not a Christian attribute. Because if I act like there are no issues, so I want to be seen like a nice, mature Christian person. I don't have any problems with anybody. But in the, on the inside, I do. I'm a hypocrite. And I will pay the price for it. If you're acting that way, you will pay the price for it. Issues need to be dealt with immediately. Very important in Christian life. Then let's move on because we have so much territory to cover. Jesus goes into another issue. Verse 27. You have heard it said to you, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. This is very heavy for gentlemen and ladies. I won't go into too much because of the age variation here, but it applies to both groups. If, if you're a lady looking for attention in all the wrong ways, the way you dress, the way you act, the way you portray yourself on social media, the way you portray yourself to others, you're in very dangerous ground. And men, on your phones, in the movies, on your websites, what are you looking at? Just because nobody is seeing it, that doesn't mean God doesn't know. We are accountable to the Lord, not to other people. And I give this advice to young men. Seeing is free. Looking always has a price. Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul, uh, King David saw Bathsheba. If he looked away, that would have been the end of that. Once he looked at her, started a course of events that ruined his life and many others lives. So remember this. You might accidentally, by chance, whatever the case, might see something or someone. But if you look, you are in big trouble. Don't look. look away. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This is the severity of sin and reality of hell. Punishment. Serious stuff in the Christian life. Again, if you're not a Christian, don't be scared. This doesn't apply to you. If you're a Christian, take this very seriously. There's another controversial issue. This is Jesus, not me. Okay? If you have a problem, you have it with him, not me. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. In that time, it was easy. If you're a man and you didn't like the way your wife cooked, you just took a piece of paper, you said, I divorced this woman because she burned my food. They go, go back to your father's house. That was it. That's all it took. But Jesus, going to the heart of the matter, says, But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. <coughs> Serious issue. Christian life, yes, divorces, we see, we hear, 
there are write cases, there are drone cases, but Christian life, there is no divorce. So those of you who are not married, make sure you marry the one God has for you. Who is the one God has for you? Uh, an equally committed Christian that wants to walk with the Lord and serve Him. You must be equally yoked. You cannot be unequal. If you see somebody who's not a believer and you really like him, he's so cute and dreamy, and you can make him a Christian one day, don't do it. You will be miserable for the rest of your life. Okay? If you see a good-looking young lady, she's living in the world, and you say, you know what? She believes in God. I, I feel it. It's like she, she has some kind of a belief inside. Don't do it. You will be miserable. Very important to be equally yoked. Amen. Again, verse 33. You have heard it said that ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. In English, we don't, we don't use too many of those. In, in terms of it's called yimmy. And it's always, almost swearing. Like, I swear to this and that that, that I'm going to do it in this. He say, don't do that. What is he saying? But I say to you, this is Jesus again. Make no oaths at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for the city, that's the city of the king. Nor shall you make any oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair black or white. But let your statement be, yes, yes, no, no. Pay attention to this last part. Anything beyond these is all the evil one. So what does that mean? Yes, yes, no, no. My character has to be such that when somebody asks me a question and I give them an answer, I shouldn't have to swear to whatever or whoever. I shouldn't have to convince them with a thousand words. I shouldn't have to manipulate, gaslight, passive aggressively, force them, exaggerate, minimize, none of these. Your yes is yes, your no is no. What you say is truth, and that's it. Everybody knows that sister such and such, brother such and such, does not lie. That must be a Christian's character. Oh, it's a white lie, it's not important. Please know there is no such thing as a white lie. You're either lying, or you're, well, it's for business. <laughs> Worse. No lie. There is no small lie. There are no medium lies. There are no pink lies, purple lies, white lies, turquoise lies. What? Uh, no. <laughs> no lies. Orange. Orange. Thank you. <laughs> Yellow. No lies. We can excuse it, and we, we camouflage lies, right? When you exaggerate something to convince the other person of your point of view. That's lying. When you undermine it or minimize it, that's lying. When you gaslight somebody, that's lying. You know what gaslighting means? No. <sighs> I know what flashlighting means. <laughs> flashlighting. <laughs> Treating somebody in a way that they question themselves. A lot of narcissists do it, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, being passive aggressive to manipulate people, not really saying things, but staying away, or being quiet. You know, the silent treatment. That's lying. That doesn't befit a Christian. Our yes is yes, our no is no. That's it. 
That's the kind of people we have to be. When Pat says something to me, he doesn't have to swear up and down heaven for me to believe him. I believe him. Do you? No. <laughs> 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 of course. <laughs> so that's how we have to be. You see, when we started the first night, is, is, is there a picture of a person, a character attribute forming in your eye of what a Christian should be? And if any of these things, if any of these things that we're reading here is zinging in your heart, you have to deal with it. God is trying to get your attention to that issue. Benjamin Franklin very famously one day said, the zing in every rebuke is the truth. If something is zinging in your heart, that might be the Holy Spirit nudging you. Hey, you have this issue. Deal with it. Confess, repent, change, grow, whatever it is. All right, let's continue. Another issue. Well, this is a tough one. Verse 38. You have heard it was said that for an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Mm. If somebody takes your eye out, you have to take his eye out. Right? That's how we understand it. Actually, the actual law doesn't say you have to take his eye out. The actual standard is you can't take anything more than his eye. It's a limit, it's not a license. That's another issue. But that's what people believe. If he broke my arm, I'm going to break his arm. But I say to you, this is a tough one, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you for your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. You know where this comes from? Go one mile, two mile. When the Romans occupied Jerusalem, they passed a law. If a Roman soldier came to the local public and he asked them to carry his weapons or if there was a load that he had or is a shield and all that stuff. Every citizen of that country had to carry that soldier's equipment for one mile. That was the law. This is what Jesus is referring to. He's saying, if he asks you to carry it one mile, you carry it two miles. You don't like it, right? No, because it... Tell me, tell me. They said, okay, you have to give $100 for the tax. Now I pay $200? Mm. Sure. Just give You can handle it, I'm sure. What? You say? I understand. The issue is, as you can see, he's talking about being a giving, a generous person. It's all going to go He's going to talk about our money, too. $100. But and he's calling us to be relaxed people. You know, we are not. We are, we are very uptight. We really are. We are high strong. He's saying relax. Why are you looking at me when you say that? I am. <laughs> You're just in my field of vision. <laughs> you have four cups of coffee today. You see, be generous. Giving person, yes. I, I was going to say regarding that law of one mile, it's all it's about attitudes, like you're saying, yeah. to be relaxed because the tendency would be if the limit is one mile, that the soldier can't ask you to bring it beyond that. People would be like, at this step, drop it. Nope, I'm not yeah. going to step more. So yeah. their attitude is that of resentment and bitterness. Yeah. So he's saying, no, no, just be like, okay, you, you need help, we can help you. You know, so it's, it's your heart. Exactly. It's a tough one to think about. Mm -hmm. Be generous. Your motive. Your motive, your attitude, right? So true. 
Give to him who asks of you. Do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, it's up to you to decide. There's a beggar. He's homeless. He's a dry addict. He, he's asking for money. And if you give him money, he's going to use it for drugs. What are you going to do? Don't give it to him. Don't give him the cash. Well, he, he didn't say he needs it for food. He just wants money. Yeah, he doesn't want to get money. Jennifer, what are you going to do? What do you think? Can you repeat the question again? You want me to use it in a sentence? You're going to be Jesus says, whoever asks from you, give it to them. You know, don't turn them away. But I said, there's a beggar, homeless person, who's a drug addict, he's asking for money, you know he's going to use it for drugs. <laughs> what are you going to do? You buy him drugs, so he kills You should, no, I don't think you should buy him drugs. <laughs> Yes. I, I knew one Jewish guy. Mm -hmm. He always kept quarters okay. in his pocket. Whoever asked money that he knew if they were going to buy drugs, he gave him 25 cents and he walks away. Not enough to buy. Okay. I don't know, that's the solution. Well, good thing he's not Christian then. Yeah. <laughs> it was a Hasidic Jew. Here's the truth. That in the Bible it says you have to believe the Christian, the other Christian. So the obligation of trust is to the other Christian. The blind, blind trust that your Christian brother asks you for money, you just give him. It doesn't say Christian brother. So the blind trust is only uh, granted to a Christian brother. So if it's not a Christian person, if it's not a believer, you have two choices. Either you give it blindly, you don't want the, the other person responsible how he's going to use the money, you did your part, you gave it, you don't take care of responsibility. But if you really care for it, the only thing that will prove that you really care whether your gift that you give him is a, for the goodness or not for good uh, or for bad thing, he's going to do drugs and stuff, then you should put in the diligence of acquiring, laboring, you need to put the labor, the time, the efforts to find out what is he going to use it for? He needs uh, how many take it to a restaurant, feed him. Uh, and so if you're not going to put all that labor to find out, just give it to him. But if you really, really want to know whether it's going to be used for good stuff or not, then put in the labor, work for it, work hard to find out and help the guy and give the money. But help him also so that money doesn't serve him. So it's up to your integrity. If you really care, put in the labor, then give the money. Yes. In the uh, book of Acts, there's a situation where two apostles were coming to Jerusalem and there was a beggar asking for money. And what did he say? I can't give you money, but I can give you the you know, story. Yes, he said, silver and gold I do not have. Yes. But I, what I do have, I give it to you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk, right? So, absolutely. So, what are you saying? I'm saying, don't give the money. <laughs> he's saying he's, 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 he's saying tell him the gospel message like tell him the saving message that's what you got out of that illustration <laughs> alright well the answer is I don't know I, I, I don't know. I think every situation is different. This is one of those situations where you say, Lord, should I give him one? He'll tell you. That's why we need to have that ongoing connection. First Pat, then Jennifer. Yes, Pat. Um, I'm, I'm going to back up Armin's answer. Uh, okay. He's correct. As far as, 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 far as what I see, uh, I was put into a situation where I was giving a Christian money, but I didn't know he had a secret or, or a hidden drug addiction on the side. 
So in a, in a sense, I trusted him. Nobody knew he had a drug addiction until he, uh, he was found in a crack house and he wound up in the hospital. Uh, but as Armin was saying before, and I agree that it's, I think God is going to judge us, even if we gave uh, wrongly, no, not wrongly, but uh, uh, without knowing, right, um, out of ignorance, let's say. Uh, but it's the motive of our heart that, that he's going to judge. In other words, we gave out of the good intent, but that person used it for the bad intent. Yeah. Okay, so um, I back my brother over there. Jennifer. should be one of generosity. It should be gener one of giving. Comfortable, easy, being an easygoing person. All right. Well, here's a really difficult one. Verse 30, 43. What's that story? You have heard it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, you shall love your enemy and pray for those who persecute. Let me read it again. 
This is Jesus, not me. Don't mm -hmm. take it. Don't yell at me. Mm -hmm. You have heard it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now what? How do you love your enemy? Henry. Can I throw a question at you? Because <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I think I think this one is actually more difficult than the last uh, commandment that you gave us. Um, when you say love, what, define what kind of love you're talking about. You're not going to be say Juliet wronged me and she you know slashed my tires and say, "Hey, am I good buddy Juliet? I love you." You know, I mean, it's not going to happen that it's way. Not lovey, lovey. You no, it's, what 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 would you? How would you? I mean, I tried to, I had one boss that I, I, very difficult man to work with, and I, I believe me, as much as I, I dreamt bashing his head in with a baseball bat, but kept my mouth shut and try to do my job the best that I can, really. But I'm, and I'm just being honest. Uh, so is, is that the kind of love you're talking about? Just suck it in and, 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 and just bite the bullet and you know, walk, work along with them without retaliation, or what's the kind of love that we're looking for here, Steve? That, that's what I'd like to know. Good question. Because it's tough. That's a tough love. You know. to say tolerate your enemy. I'm, I missed that guy. I'm sorry. Tolerate, tolerate your enemy. Tolerate your it enemy. It says love your enemy. And pray for those that persecute you. Not just yeah, you watch coexist. He says love. I mean, indifference is just like hate, some might argue. They say, what's the opposite of love? Somebody says it's indifference. Mm. It's even worse than hate, mm -hmm. they say, because you could care less if they live or die. Uh, but Jesus says, love your enemy. How difficult is this? Has anybody mastered this? Please share with us. You're at the first step, okay. Tell us. So, um, the hardest part for me was during the attacks of Azerbaijan and Turkey to Armenia. Mm -hmm. 